Welcome to r slash Entitled People, where we share stories from your lives about people who think the rules don't apply to them, and they should get what they want. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel, and for so many likes. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, Hotel's Compassionate Outreach Program Exploited, when a free stay turns into a vacation or two. The second story, the epic revenge of an undervalued systems analyst. The third story, bowling drama, entitled mother's plan backfires. The first story is, why just look when you can punch a gift horse in the mouth instead? The hotel I work at has a partnership with a local homeless outreach organization where we put up people, almost always families, in the hotel for a week at a time to try and give them a chance to catch their breath and maybe work to get on their feet. We don't get any money for their stay, we comp the bill entirely, but it's really good for our reputation. Now this is a really good program and it generally goes really well for us and the people staying. Even if the folks who stay just use the time as a family vacation, that's fine. No different from any other guest and after living on the street or out of a car for months, maybe years, I can't judge them for just kicking back with their kids at the pool all day. That being said, there are always people who are given an inch and take a mile and try to ruin it for everyone. Last week, the org sent us over a single mother who was living out of her car with her baby, perfect candidates for our program. We invited this woman to come stay at the hotel for a week and she naturally came. Now, I don't work up at the front, but my sister does and she checked this woman in. As far as my sister remembers, this woman was perfectly fine. She came up to the desk, said who she was, got her key, and went right up with a tote of her belongings. Nothing out of the ordinary. A day later I'm mopping the lobby when a man comes down and says he wants to get ice and accidentally locked himself out at 202. Okay, the woman working the front, Kelly, goes through the usual questions for getting a person a new key for a room. Problem is, his name isn't on the reservation. Only a woman is listed and if you want a key you have to be listed as someone who's allowed to get one. Kelly tells him to call the woman up and have her call the hotel to confirm he can get a key. So he tries, but our lobby phone wasn't working, so Kelly just called the woman up from her phone. The woman answer and Kelly explains that a man is asking you to get a key for the room, but he isn't on the reservation or the list of approved guests. The woman wasn't understanding what happened, so Kelly hands the phone to the man. The man talks to her and tells her he just locked himself out, and she needs to give him permission to get a key to the room. The woman understands and tells Kelly he can have a key to the room and get added to the list of approved guests. Perfect. Life is good, all is well. Except it isn't. About 10 minutes later, someone, either the GM or Jake, our front desk supervisor, realizes 202 is the room the homeless woman is staying in. Now, for any other guest, having a second person in your room is perfectly acceptable. You've paid for a room which can hold two people. We have no extra fee for that, so you can invite whoever you want. But the agreement we have with the org is that the only approved guests are allowed to stay. They are here on our dime and we're only paying for them to use our electricity, water, breakfast, gym equipment, pool, etc. Inviting additional guests is explicitly forbidden and they are told before they arrive that this room is for them and their children only. So Jake tries to call the room to figure out who this dude is. No answer. He asks housekeeping about the room and while it didn't have a D&D &D on the door, it was bolted shut so the housekeeper couldn't get in. Jake then calls the woman back to ask her about the man in the room reminding her she can't have any extra guests. She says she doesn't have anyone else staying with her, there's no one in the room. Um, no? Jake tells her there's currently someone in the room, we just saw him 10 minutes ago and he needs to leave. She says she'll handle it when she gets back, whenever that may be. GM comes out and says she talked to the org and the guest has violated literally the only real rule we have in place for these stays and she's being thrown out. Jake understands and agrees, and calls the woman to let her know she needs to come back now because she cannot stay the night. The woman then changes her tune. She's on her way back right now and this is all just a big misunderstanding. Jake says he'll see her when she comes in. She then calls back again, and again, and again. She calls at least six times in the span of 20 minutes to see about speaking to the GM. Jake sends her back to her voicemail every time, but tells her that she doesn't have an agreement with the hotel, the org does, and she needs to speak to her social worker and get them to contact the hotel. She keeps saying she will, but she keeps calling the hotel and we get nothing from her social worker or the org. Well, we still need to get this guy out of the room, so we lock their cards by making a new one and using it on the door. Tammy, our housekeeping supervisor, does this on her and says the door is still bolted, signifying someone is still in there despite this woman's constant claims that no one is. 
Jake, our resident military man and only real kind of security we have here, is elected to go up and basically scare this dude out. Jake is thrilled at this prospect and heads up, ready to strike the fear of God into this rando. What he finds, however, is a room that opens fine. He checks the place and there's no one there. So, the dude is out of the room, but he didn't come down the elevator, so where is he? At this point, the whole hotel is sort of low-key told, yeah, there might be an unknown dude who might be upset about being thrown out wandering the halls. Keep a phone or walkie on you. Which is a spooky thing to tell your staff, and no one's sure what to do with that, but we're like that for about 20 minutes as we try to locate this guy. No one has any idea how to locate this guy or what to do if he breaks something, given that he's not a guest so we don't have his ID or any cards on file. Within like five minutes, the housekeepers are circulating rumors that you have to stay away from the vending machines because that's where he's likely to be hiding. Like there's a serial killer loose in the hotel, and I'm sent at this point to check some places and find him, given that I know what he looks like. Yeah, me. I actually do find him, but nothing happens. Turns out he's just outside wandering around the parking lot, suggesting he came down a staircase to try and sneak out. So, crisis over and we go back to normal. A minute or so after that, uh, nonsense, the woman arrives. She's pretty collected, but she's trying to explain what happened. She says that the man in her room is a man she met just that day in the parking lot, who she asked to help bring her things in from her car, and that she let him into her room so he could help carry her things up for her. Kelly immediately goes, you just let a stranger into your room? With your baby? Like she was concerned, but really she just knew this lady was lying. That story is mad dumb to begin with and didn't make any sense at all. She kept saying she's never met this man before and she wasn't letting him stay with her. This story is weird, but could have been at least mildly believable except for one part. She gave him permission to her room, not an hour earlier over the phone. It would be in the realm of possibility that some rando she met in a parking lot had carried her things up to the room and somehow managed to stay in the room until she left, claiming he was going to help her. It would be stupid of her, but sure, plausible. It would also be possible that this same man tried to get a key to the room by coming down to the front. What is not possible is this man she doesn't know gives her a call saying he got locked out, and she gives us permission to make him a key to the room. That isn't something you do for a man you never met before. He had an ice bucket in his hands and no shoes on, so he was obviously staying in that room. As she's talking, Jake just tells her, your keys won't work, I'll take you up to get your things. She keeps trying to explain all the way up the elevator and I imagine while she's getting her things in the room. Nothing comes of it though and she carries her tow to belongings back out to the car, gets in and leaves. At this point, my heart got a little heavy. Right or wrong, what she did wasn't necessarily terrible and it was sad to watch as someone who's struggling have to leave their free week-long hotel stay after just one night. Then Kelly turned and said, where's her baby? It was like a record scratch. Where was that baby? My sister said she didn't have it when she came in. All she had was her toad of things. The baby wasn't with the man who was in the room. I saw him pacing outside. The baby wasn't in the room. Jake didn't see one when he checked in. The baby wasn't with the woman when she came in to argue her case or when she left the hotel. And she couldn't have known how long she was gonna be in the building between the conversation in the lobby and the trip up to the room so she couldn't have left the baby in the car. This whole stay, which was built specifically around providing a safe place for this baby, was in actuality being used as some of kind of week-long paid vacation for this woman and her boyfriend, husband, baby daddy, or whatever. That's the exact opposite of what this program is for. After that, all our empathy shot down. She was trying to play the hotel and she got caught. It be like that. She called pretty regularly for the rest of the evening saying she's spoken to her social worker and they're fine letting her stay and she just needs to explain to the GM what happened because she doesn't want her baby to have to sleep in a car. We knew at that point that wherever this alleged baby was sleeping, it wasn't with her in a car. We also received no calls from her social worker or the org on her behalf despite her claims that they're also trying to get her back into the hotel. After half an evening of this, Jake took the phone and told her, we cannot help you, don't call us again. And she still called one more time. She was clearly upset at having lost her week-long vacay, but honestly, we all had a laugh over how furious she must be at this guy for getting locked out. We never would have known he was in there if he didn't come down to get that key, and even if we did, she could have maybe come up with a lie about who he was. Instead, she literally gave us permission to give him a key, and she must be kicking himself and him for that. Way to throw away a good thing by doing something stupid like that. What's that phrase? Never do something illegal while you're doing something illegal? Well, in this case, never do something stupider while you're doing something stupid. The second story is from 30K to Mutiny. I got my first job with a nonprofit a few months after earning my bachelor's degree. They wanted an entry-level systems analyst with no experience for 40K yearly. Keep in mind, this was nearly 15 years ago. 
They hired me, but because I had no experience in my field, remember this is what they were looking for, they offered me 30. I accepted on the condition that if I'm still employed in a year and I'm meeting their expectations, they raise my salary to 40k, which they agreed. A year passes and no raise, so true to my words I left a month later and got the additional 10k somewhere else. A few years later I came back to that company. It was really a lateral move for me to get away from the stress of my then employers. I was also in school for my masters in business, and I had explained when I'm done with my program in a year, I want more money or I'll walk again, and again they agreed and a year passes and they just scoff. So I left again and took nearly the entire department out the door with me and made sure they knew I had created a mutiny that basically left their entire IT department completely unstaffed. The best part? I had been working on a critical project, so before I left I proposed an arrangement. Retain me as a consultant. I'll finish the project on time, and they won't be fined into oblivion by the local, state, and federal governments for being non-compliant in their patient recidivism reporting. I asked for $75 an hour, and explained their only other option is to outsource this to the only consulting company that did this type of work at $200 an hour. They actually laughed and said, I'll give you $25. Run that past your accountant. I didn't argue. I smiled, accepted, signed the agreement, and I triple billed those MFers for so much as reading an email and rode that for nearly a year and a half. They should have just given me the 10K. The third story is... One, two, knockout in bowling? Background. I'm a two-handed bowler like Jason Belmont. This means that my bowling balls only have the finger holes, meaning you have to know what you're doing to use them effectively. I've also seen extremely bad ball damage making me cautious around young kids, as they often use bumpers and very light balls. Mine are 15 pounds or 6.8 kilograms. These balls also cost about 200 US dollars. Also, young kids often think my high scores are caused by my equipment. Cast, me, monkey entertainer. EM, Karen, EC, entitled child. IDK, innocent dumb kid. Story, I'm bowling pretty well, 180s, and it's crowded. The entitled family is put next to me. After one game, the kid starts trying to copy me, which is normal. What's not normal is trying to take someone's equipment. EC attempts to take my bowling ball. Me, please don't touch my equipment as it's quite heavy. EM, how dare you? Me, what? EM, EC can use whatever he likes. Me, no, he can't. He could barely use a six pound ball. EM. Let him try, at least. Me. Sure. Only if he can pick it up. Knowing full well he can't. He fails. EM. Fine. Me thinking this is all over. Five minutes later I hear EM telling IDK to grab one of my balls when I'm not looking. IDK does just that when I'm doing my approach, which causes me to elbow him in the face and hit him with the ball I was using. A code red, the irony. IDK is on the floor. He's clearly breathing. EM. How dare you harm my innocent angel. Me. He was standing behind me. That's why there's bowler's courtesy. EM. I'm gonna sue you, the manager, and the owner. I legitimately know both as my parents are good friends with them and I plan to get a job there. I'm calling the police. The police show up with paramedics and rush IDK off. When I explain myself, EM screams, liar. The employees, some of whom I know, back me up, and EM and her family is banned from that bowling alley. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video.